John Eric Nelson is, is, is back, and, and many of you know him. A uh, uh, quick bio, uh, Nellie grew up in uh, Milford, Connecticut, uh, graduated high school in 1965, I think, is that right? And uh, then went off and spent four years in the Marines, did a couple of tours in Vietnam, uh, came back, got his uh, degree, uh, began teaching in the Milford schools, where he basically spent his um, education, a lot of that in high school, coaching football and wrestling and other things, and, and as far as we're concerned, he became involved with reenacting. I think that, I think according to your bio, that was around 1978 that you started reenacting as, as a French and Indian War reenactor, our, our period, uh, and he's been doing that ever since, and, and not only is, a, is he a living historian, but he's, a, he's actually a, an actual a real historian who <laughs> has been studying the era uh, and, and, and others as well for a long time. Uh, we had him at our annual meeting last year where he gave us one of his presentations on, on the Crown Point Road, our, our Crown Point Road, and our uh, directors were so pleased with it, we had decided we'd invite him back this year, especially since we knew we were going to come to Fort Number 4, where John was a, a director for, for many years, a trustee, I guess is the proper word, but, uh, and um, we talked about what he should talk about, and we, we, decided, we decided that uh, he would be talking about Colonel Nathan Whiting, who was a French and Indian War soldier, among other things, and, and among other things was actually the, the garrison commander here at number four in 1757. So uh, a very appropriate talk, and uh, uh, those of you that have heard John speak before know he's, he's a great presenter, and I'm pleased to present to you John Eric Nelson. <laughs> We forgot to say it was the board decided to bring me back. Last year they didn't have any tomatoes to throw at me. <laughs> <laughs> this year we get the tomatoes to throw at. I left them at home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lucky again. Um, thank you for having me again. Uh, French and Indian War is my favorite time frame. And I'm going to talk about Nathan Whitey, uh, who I've been researching for over 40 years. And just love what this guy has done. And if the good Lord allows me to live another hundred years, I might be able to write a book about him. Um, he's a fascinating character. I can't believe somebody hasn't written a book about him now. As far as the Crown Point Road Association goes, first of all, he comes into contact with the road before there is a road in 1757 when he's here. And then in 1759, he marches from Crown Point over here, and he is the one that's discharging all the provincial troops that are going home from here to New England, and then in 1761 and 62, he passes through here and discharges troops again, and in 61 and 62, he's the garrison commander over at Townsville Haunt, uh, Crown Point, and they are continually in the construction of the then largest fortification in North America. Um, what you see up on the screen on the right is Whitey's portrait, which hangs in the Connecticut Historical Society. And on the left, that's me with the uniform. I had uh, a master uh, 18th century tailor, um, Mr. Cook, make that for me. So it's identical to the ones there. The uniqueness of the uniform for anybody that is curious on uh, material culture is the sleeves and the three buttons and the the scallops right here. That is unique, and uh, historians and uh, tailoring tell me that that's there. Uh, very important piece, and nobody's ever seen that before. So that was makes that portrait unique. Um, I'm going to break this talk down into three parts. The first part, I'm going to talk about what he does here and what's happening at Fort Number Four in 1757. Then I'm going to talk a, a very quickly about Nathan Whitey um, on a talk normally. It takes me an hour just to talk about him. I have so much stuff. And then the third part is a document that I found, a map that I found in the Connecticut Historical Society back at the beginning of COVID. And it was one of those times when you go to do research in, in archives, we call it the golden 15 minutes. You're in that archive, buried in books and uh, artifacts for five, six hours, and you can't find a damn thing. 
and then 15 minutes before the place closes, you find the Holy Grail, and after you fall down from fainting, uh, you have this piece. So I'm going to do uh, unveil that with the caveat that I have not been back and been able to find its provenance, so I don't know how accurate it is. I am 95% sure about what I'm going to say about it today, and I need to do more research. So that's how we're going to start. So where, where are we in the war? In North America, we call it the French and Indian War. In Europe, they call it the Seven Years' War. In 1754, George Washington goes out and gets his butt kicked at Fort Necessity in western Pennsylvania. That starts this whole thing, becomes a global war. The following year, the British send their regular troops under Edward Braddock uh, in 1755. He goes out to western Pennsylvania, the Monaga Hill. He gets his butt kicked. And Governor Shirley of New, uh, Massachusetts is supposed to go take Fort Niagara out on Lake Ontario, and he does nothing. He stumbles around in his swago and can't do anything. So now British are... 0 for 2. Battle of Lake George in 55 takes place under Sir William Johnson, and our friend Whiting here is a very important part of that battle. They win the battle, so the British have one victory. And Colonel Moncton goes up to uh, Fort Bourgeois up in Nova Scotia and captures that fort at Fort Bourgeois. So that's where we are. 1756 is an abject disaster. The British do nothing and the French General Montcalm goes down and captures Fort Oswego out on Lake Ontario. And that brings us to the winter of 1757. <coughs> in December of 1756, the British North American Commander-in-Chief, Lord Loudon, who has replaced Governor Shirley as Commander-in-Chief here, lays out his plans for the 1757 campaign season. After two years of war against the French, the British have little to show for their efforts. 1756 had seen a great French victory in Oswego by General Montcalm, and the British were sitting around doing absolutely nothing. On January 21st, 1757, Colonel Nathan Whiting had an interesting Masonic experience when he attended a banquet for the Right Honorable John Campbell the Earl of Loudoun, who replaced Shirley. Loudoun was the Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of England, and as such, he was the highest ranking Mason in North America at the time. The banquet was held in Concert Hall in Boston. It was to celebrate the Feast of St. John the Evangelist. Masons from all over the Northeast were in attendance. This event may have well put Colonel Whiting in a better relationship with the Commander-in-Chief than any other provincial officer, which can be seen in letters between the two. I mention this because it's important. One of the things when you start reading the letters between Loudon, the commander-in-chief, who's a high-ranking British aristocrat, and provincial officers, there's a disdain. North American provincials, they're down in the bottom of the almost the scum barrel, and the aristocrats are up here. And you see that in the letters. Whiting gets letters from Loudon and the correspondence between the two is on a different level. And I think part of it is because they're both Masons um, and Whiting is very admirable. Also, I mention it because this is the age of enlightenment in Europe and these social clubs, of which Masonry was one, were very popular and were being imported to North America. So almost anyone who was anyone in North America or Europe belonged to a social organization and Probably a lot of them were Masons as we look at our founding fathers. In a November letter, Loudon stated his plan for the next year. Quote, my plan for the provincial troops. Provincial troops are the ones who are living in North America at the time. They're not coming from England. Is not to take many of them. And, if I can imagine, manage that point, as to have all those from New England as rangers and to send them into the enemy's country by number four, where I shall erect a magazine for them, unquote. And send them into the enemy's country by Otter Creek and the lower end of Lake Champlain, 
to make all the disturbance in their power and if they can break up the settlements on this side of the St. Lawrence River and drive the inhabitants there, they will distress them greatly in their provisions. And when we arrive before Quebec, we can transport them over the river, and when their business is done on one side, we turn them loose on the north side, which means no enemy can move toward us, but we must have early notice of and be able to harass them on their march." Unquote. Loudon's plan was to take a large force by ship north to Halifax, and from there move up the St. Lawrence River and attack Quebec and Montreal. He would leave a force at Fort Edward and Fort William Henry, the whole Lake George area, while he made his end run around the St. Lawrence to attack Quebec. But the plan failed, and Loudon's fleet would be still stuck at Halifax throughout the year and never move toward the St. Lawrence. The French general, Montcalm, is going to come in, cooperate. Oh, I'm going to show you Swago. We missed that one. Um, the general Montcalm, the French general, will take advantage of this and sweep down Lake George and destroy Fort William Henry during the summer. In February of 1757, the Connecticut General Assembly resolved to raise 1,400 men to be formed into one regiment of 14 companies and they are to act with the regular British troops under the command of the Earl Loudon in a campaign against French forces at Crown Point. In a letter from Loudon to Prime Minister William Pitt, he states the following, quote, I have already ordered 200 of the New Hampshire men into Fort No. 4 on the Connecticut River for security of that place, unquote. This will be a theme throughout the whole year. The garrison in number four was expected to guard the country from the upper Merrimack River to Lake Champlain. The colony of Massachusetts has supported Fort Number Four in the past because of its importance to the defense of its own settlements. It now felt that the time had come when it would be safe to withdraw their forces, thus relieving Massachusetts from the burden which for many years she had felt her duty to bear, that of sustaining a frontier not within her own jurisdiction. During the winter of 1756-57, the only troops in the area, this area right here, were 55 Massachusetts men down at Fort Hensdale on the Connecticut River, south of here. On the 23rd of March, 1757, Lieutenant Colonel Nathan Whiting was appointed to command 500 men from Connecticut who were to march north the fort at number four on the Connecticut River, which is now Charlestown, New Hampshire. The rest of the Connecticut troops, under the command of Colonel Phineas Lyman, were to march up the Hudson River to Fort Edward in New York. Loudon reports that, quote, none of the New England troops were ready by the 25th of March. 200 New Hampshire men assigned to guard garrison at number four, until the arrival of the new Connecticut detachment, failed to put it in appearance and left the tiny fort defenseless against an enemy attack, which did occur on the 20th of April, which cost seven lives and some being carried off to Canada. Governor Wentworth of New Hampshire put the blame for this disaster on his committee of war and their neglect of providing supplies. Loudon continues, quote, that the province of New Hampshire had agreed to send 250 troops back in February who should have marched in a fortnight to take possession of the little fort there. And in the middle of April, there was not but one of them arrived. I have heard nothing of the New Hampshire men as of yet. When provincial troops are out of sight, they move very slowly, and the distance is great." Unquote. On the 25th of April, Lord Loudon reports, quote, that Lieutenant Colonel Whiting and 500 Connecticut troops 
were then on the march to relieve the New Hampshiremen who weren't there either. Unquote. Early in the spring of 1757, Colonel Nathan Whiting hires a horse, a saddle, a bridle, and begins his journey north to the fort at number four from his home in New Haven, Connecticut. He hires another horse in Hartford for the trip to Deerfield, where he hires a cart, a cart to move his baggage from Northfield to Fort Number Four. When he and the Connecticut troops reach Fort Number Four, they relieve what New Hampshire troops had finally gotten there and are under the command of Colonel Goff, who was ordered then to march to Fort Edward by way of Albany. On the 20th of June, Major John Gillum at, New, uh, at Albany remarks on the condition of these men upon reaching Fort Edwards. These are the Massachusetts, uh, the New Hampshire men that went from Fort over to Fort Edwards. Quote, said troops, which are greatly fatigued and dispirited by such a long and unexpected march and wants of necessary supplies, unquote. Loudon writes to Whitey on the 20th of June, quote, I would likewise keep out large scouting parties from number four to alarm their St. Francis Indians up on the St. Lawrence River at Odenat and prevent their being able to employ them against you. I am more eager in my wishes that this should be done, not be delayed, unquote. He also orders that one surgeon's mate, that's a doctor, for the troops at number four to be sent. The Connecticut Assembly follows suit by ordering that the commissaries, those are the guys that are going to have the supplies for the troops that are in the field, of the colony take care with all possible expedition to send forward to number four the box or chest of medicines and such things as have been provided for the use of the forces of that colony. They then provided 10 pounds for a decent reception and suitable support of a chaplain for the fort. On the 4th of July, 1757, Whiting writes to his mother-in-law, Mary Clapp, from the fort at number four. He talks about an upcoming family wedding back in New Haven that he will miss. Quote, I should have thought myself happy to have been a wedding guest but I am obliged to sacrifice my enjoyment of my friends to the service of my country." Unquote. A return of Connecticut troops showed that on July 15th, there were 487 men at Fort Number 4. At the same time, there were about 30 families living in and around the fort. On August 3rd, 1757, the French general Montcalm and the French army invest Fort William Henry. And six days later, the fort capitulates after the siege. News of native attacks on the surviving members leaving the fort soon spreads throughout New England. Did John Eric? Yes. Conestone kind of or wagon? Is that uh, anachronistic? Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Tom. <laughs> That's one of the paintings from the Glens Fall Bank collection that's there. Nice. And when you look, there's about eight pa paintings of that whole Lake George area. And Tom, you'll go nuts picking out an acronym. So, so save your energy. <laughs> the uh, alarm spread quickly. General Webb sends out a request for reinforcements to all the New England colonies. Quote, Connecticut responded by raising 5,000 more men than they had already raised and marches them to Fort Edward. Within a week, they get there. They take every wagon, every horse they could get, and they scoot up there to reinforce Fort William uh, Henry and Fort Edward. They arrive before Fort William Henry. By the time they arrive, Fort William Henry had fallen, and they end up accomplishing nothing before they were dismissed on August 25th. The cost of this futile effort to Connecticut was 15,000 pounds. That's a lot of money. New Hampshire's response to the request was poor at best. 
noting that it was a long 350 miles from Portsmouth, New Hampshire to Fort William Henry. And they could not raise more men without leaving their colony, New Hampshire, exposed to attack. They decided to support any place in New Hampshire or Massachusetts that comes under direct attack by the French. So they raised a battalion of 400 men under the command of Major Thomas Tash for the relief of William Henry. But before they could march to relieve Fort William Henry, the French had already withdrawn back to Fort Carrion, Ticonderoga today. August 13, 1757, General Webb orders New Hampshire men to provide 200 foot and 200 horse to march immediately to Fort Number 4 and relieve the Connecticut troops there. The Connecticut troops under Colonel Whiting were then to march from Fort Number 4 over to Fort Edward and rejoin with the rest of the Connecticut force under Lyman. By September 1st, somewhere over 200 of the New Hampshire troops finally arrived. And the report reads, quote, the rest dallied along the route to that extreme frontier post and then, according to reports, ran away in companies. But the scandal did not stop there. New Hampshire mounted troops that had reached the place went off in a body. On the 2nd of September, riding away with such speed that they could not be caught or brought back. The foot soldiers that had arrived were so very impatient of being detained that their commander, that the commander of the Connecticut forces, who had planned to leave with his troops as soon as the Hampshire guys got there, the view of that, the people of the settlement of Fort Number Four and those settlements further south were in great fear that he, Whitey, must remain with his men. On September one. The inhabitants of Fort Number 4 petitioned General Webb, and I'm paraphrasing here. It's been great having Colonel Whiting here at Number 4. Can we please keep him and his men so we're not defenseless? Unquote. Isaac Parker, who's here, writes to Lord Loudon requesting that Whiting and the Connecticut troops be allowed to stay as without them, the fort would be defenseless. On September 1st, Whiting writes to General Webb, Sir, I have received your orders by Lieutenant McNeil to march to Fort Edward immediately, as soon as I am relieved by the New Hampshire Regiment, which I shall cheerfully obey. I have now to acquaint you that Major Tash arrived yesterday from New Hampshire with 90 horse, and 24 foot, remember it's supposed to be 200 and 200, whose orders from Governor Wentworth are to put themselves under my command, by which it appears the governor did not know that I had orders to march from here. I have ordered my Connecticut force to hold themselves in readiness to march. The commander of these new troops tells me 500 men were raised, but for some reason one half were stopped and the other half not all arrived yet, that they had not thought of relieving me, and the men are very adverse to staying, especially the troops, who I am told this minute are running away in companies. I shall be perplexed should they go off in numbers to know what to do, being not half my numbers at first, and they running off, I am concerned for the garrison and people at number four. In every respect, as far as I know, I march tomorrow, all or part of my company, as I find the behavior of the new troops. Should they all run off, I hope it will meet with your approbation if I stay with my command till further orders from you. Dr. Harris is also at a loss whether it is duty to attend my command and go away or stay with the troops that relieve me here. I have not ceased sending out scouts to reconnoiter the country between here and Lake Champlain. In September, Whiting writes 
the following report at number four to Lord Loudon. Quote, as I have not ceased sending out scouts to reconnoiter the country, I have since my last return to you had two scouts out at Lake Champlain. The first, Lieutenant Pierce, with 14 men, lay in sight of Fort Crown Point, part two days. On the 12th of August, in sight of Ticonderoga, heard the firing of 12 cannon, but not near enough to discover the motions. Saw at Crown Point, a very large encampment. Last night, Lieutenant Ferris came in from the lake with five men. He imagined he had been between the two forts. He saw neither nor any motion of the enemy. He came back in four days, four days from Crown Point over here. And they both reported the way to be good, and that a good road may pretty easily be made for carriage, unquote. On September 20th, Peter Larry writes to Lord Loudon from Fort Hinsdale, south of here on the Connecticut, seeking protection for the area around Fort Number 4. Throughout October and November, desertions continued by the New Hampshire men. In early October, there were but 55 New Hampshire privates still at Fort Number 4. None at Bellows Falls. 16 were at Number 2, which is the Great Meadow Fort in now what is Westmoreland. 29 down in um, Brattleboro, Fort Dummer, and none at Hensdale. During the fall, Whiting reports to Loudon on the amount of work that has been done at Fort Four. The report on the numbers of men stores ordnance at the fort. He describes the construction that has been completed on the fort, including a map of the town and the river. That quote comes from the Loudon papers, which are out in the Huntington Library in California. My friend Nick Westbrook, who was the director of Fort Ticonderoga, found these when he was out there on sabbatical. He searched all over the place looking for that map, because it has a map of the area, and it also had a blueprint and map of the fortifications that were here to enhance the fort at the time. I would love to have had that map. Accounts of work being done building storehouses, making gun carriages, and a powder magazine here in the fort, uh, none of which we know where any of it was. He reports to Loudon on the number of men who could be kept at the fort or in the area during the upcoming winter. Quote, 450 men could be put under cover during the winter between the fort and post south to Northfield. Unquote. In the autumn of 1757, Loudon proposed to have each colony raise and equip provincial troops then in service. And there was they're already up here and over at Fort Edward, then in service uh, to remain on duty throughout the winter and to act as rangers. The Connecticut Assembly resolved to raise three companies of 94 men each. Two companies were to be posted at Fort Edward over on Lake George area, and the third was to remain here at Fort Number 4. Colonel Whiting writes to Colonel John Trumbull. Trumbull's the head of the supply system, the commissary for Connecticut that the troops staying at Fort Number 4 over the winter will be in need of warm winter clothing, duffel blankets, good flannel shirts, yarn hose, good shoes, warm coats, and that it will be very necessary to have some rum, sugar, ginger sent up as soon as possible as our summer stock is exhausted. He further says, the best way to get the supplies up to number four will be by horseback, as I expect the river will freeze. These supplies were ordered, sent to Fort Four by the Connecticut Assembly, and reached Fort Number Four on the 9th of December, 1757. On November 24th of 1757, Colonel Whiting is discharged from the Fort here and ends his service for the campaign season and returns to his home in New Haven, Connecticut. Colonel Whiting gets home and he writes a report that he has left 108 men and officers at Fort Number 4 under the command of Captain Reuben Ferris to serve out the winter as rangers. These men will serve all the way through and be discharged and sent home on May 14, 1758. 
On December 9th, Whiting receives a letter from uh, Captain Ferris reporting that an Indian who had been captured over at the siege of Fort William Henry earlier in the summer and taken up into Canada had made his escape from Canada and had come into the fort at number four and that the Indian report, quote, that the French Indians planned to visit number four in the spring, unquote. The next day, Whiting writes to Lord Loudon to settle his accounts for the campaign. He writes the following, I have left all the troops in number four except a party of 15 at Bellows, at the Bellows Fall, Fort Bellows, where the provisions are lodged when they pass up the Connecticut River. There are two cannons, four pounders also there, left by Captain Messrs. orders. The men I left are not used to snowshoes, but might learn by practice to make use to great advantage if they had any. He gives me, it gives me the most sensible pleasure to have any measure gained your lordship's approbation for my conduct in my command here. I have had so far the smiles of heaven not to lose, but not to lose one man by enemy or by sickness. That's amazing. Whole campaign goes through. They're up here. They got uh, 500 men. They don't lose anybody to sickness or death by firing. Over on the other side, over at Fort Edward, they're getting massacred and they're dying of disease. So what's happening here is pretty cool. If your lordship is fit to do me the honor to transmit your orders up to number four, I will gladly, by my hand, send them forward. He also settles accounts for items that he had ordered and paid for himself during the year. Quote, mending arms, paying for pilots to Lake Champlain. That's an interesting comment. Pilots would have been scouts or guides who knew the way from here over to Crown Point. So again, that route that we are interested in, the Crown Point Road, is well known. There are people that know how to get here, uh, there from here. And he's paying them to take his scouts, his troops, from here over there. That's an interesting comment in there. And this is 1757. I got lost. <laughs> and we're paying for, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, and to pay for uh, carting of baggage, posting of letters, ginger, and paying for the care of sick men that I have left at Northfield and Deerfield. The New Hampshire Assembly continues to drag its feet about the defense of Charlestown throughout the winter. Lord Loudon writes to Governor Wentworth of New Hampshire on December 26th. Quote, the point I mean to write on at present is the rangers I applied to you back in September last, in conjunction with the other provinces, which I can have no doubt you will settle or have settled with your assembly before this. Therefore, I shall take that for granted and now must desire you will march them directly to Fort Number 4, which is in your province and who call loudly for the protection of their people, which they think the Connecticut Rangers I have placed there are not sufficient in number without your New Hampshire Rangers there, you will observe that I have destined them for the immediate protection of your province. Late in February, a meeting of New England governors held in Hartford, Connecticut, found Lord Loudon again, asking that 500 men ought to be detached for the defense at Fort Number 4 for the upcoming campaign in 1758. Once again, New Hampshire Assembly would be very slow to protect their own settlements. In late December, Charlestown resident Susanna Willard Johnson met with Colonel Whiting in New Haven, Connecticut. She was returning from years of captivity in Canada after being captured from Fort Number 4 in August 29, 1754. She writes the following, quote, Then took water passage for New Haven, where I had the great good fortune to find a number of officers who had been stationed at Charlestown the preceding summer. 
who gratified my curiosity with intelligence respecting my relatives and friends at that place. Some of these gentlemen, among whom Colonel Whitey kindly undertook to assist us in our journey home by way of Springfield. At Hartford, we found some gentlemen who were bound for Charlestown. They solicited my sister, Miss Miriam Willard, to go in company with them, to which she assented, unquote. She later recorded in October of 1759, I have moved to Charlestown and took possession of my patrimony consisting of a house which Colonel Whitey had generally, uh, generously assisted my mother, Mrs. Willard, in building. Now, that ends the part of what's happening here at Fort Number 4. Now, I'm going to go through Whiting's um, bio very quickly, because normally this is an hour talk unto itself. But he's a fascinating character. Uh, if anybody want more information on him later after. So I'm going to go very quickly. If there's something, yell at me, stop, and go into detail. Um, but I'm going to fly as fast as I can. So we get out of here by next month. <laughs> Colonel Nathan Whiting, born in 1740, uh, 17, yeah, I can read, but 1724, and he died in uh, 1771. He was a freeman, a soldier, a merchant, businessman, public servant, father, and husband. He was born into a religious family in Wyndham, Connecticut. He was the youngest of 13 children, five sisters, four, uh, seven uh, brothers. He was born to a prominent, upper-middle-class, well-educated family of comfortable wealth. Most of his family members were involved in the leadership of the colony in religion, education, business, and politics of the colony. He was in that upper social stress of Connecticut. His father had been the minister of Wyndham's first church in 1700. His mother was a descendant of Deputy Governor William uh, Bradford of Plymouth Colony. His grandfather was a Harvard grad um, and was a minister also. His great-grandfather was one of the first settlers of Hartford, Connecticut and became a wealthy businessman. His grandfather, the Reverend John of Hartford uh, there, was instrumental in preventing Windsor and uh, Hartford from being attacked and overrun by Indians when he went out and warned everybody in the settlement that there was an imminent Indian attack coming. His father died a year and a half after Whitey was born. He was then raised by his sister, uh, Mary. And there's a lot of Marys in this family. It's hard to figure out who was not a Mary. Uh, who was married to the Reverend Clapp, who replaced uh, Whiting as a father. And he also replaced his father as the pastor of the first church. He probably attended an English school maintained by the church where he learned the basics, reading, writing, and arithmetic. He probably went to one of the four Latin schools. It was probably Hopkins Grammar, which is down in New Haven, and there he learned Latin and prepared for college and also picked up Greek. He went to Yale University, and he was examined for Yale in 1739 for his abilities in Latin and was accepted at the age of 14. And again, he's living with his sister. That's the Reverend Clapp, who's now the president of Yale University. That's the main, that's all it was. It was one building. You'll see it in a minute. This is the New Haven Green. That's Hopkins Grammar, so I have a strong feeling he was there. So he was accepted at Yale at age 14. His brother in law and soon becomes the head of Yale. Life at Yale, these are the things they would have got by year. You can see his. His freshman year, he would have got this. You know, I was when I was looking at this the other day, I said, we should take all those jackasses in Congress. They should go back to school and learn somebody's, like, logic. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, forms of argument and public speaking, oration. You know, basic things that they used to teach in the 18th century. They could have learned a lot in this uh, going to Yale. That is the uh, is in Yale. It's in the quadrangle by the Nathan Hale statue. Has anybody been to Yale? It is identical to the one that Whiting would have attended 
with the exception that the one he attended was wooden, burned down, and this brick one replaced it years after. But it's identical. It's the same thing, just picture it in white <coughs> wood. This is the New Haven Green. He graduated in 1743 at the age of 19. He was number one in his class. Uh, he probably stayed on as a tutor, working on his master's degree, which was common for graduates at Yale or Harvard. Why am I going backwards? Uh-oh, we have a problem. Sorry about this. Um, let's go forward. Okay. <clears throat> it doesn't like me today. Okay. After graduation, uh, the war breaks out in 1744, uh, King George's War, and New England colonies raise troops and go up to Louisburg, up above Nova Scotia and Cape Breton Island. Whiting is an ensign in that force that goes up. He is also joined by his lifelong friend, uh, David Wooster, who goes on and becomes a general in the Revolutionary War and dies at the Battle of Danbury in Connecticut. They become buddies throughout life. So Whiting goes up there in Colonel Burr's regiment. He's under the company commander of David Wooster, who's his buddy. And for, they capture the fort after 49 days. And British government gives back that fort. During the winter, Booster goes back with the French prisoners to England, becomes, we believe he becomes a mason over there, and he's the toast of the town, he meets the king and everything else. Whiting remains over the winter at Louisbourg, which is cold and miserable, and he stays there, and he joins with 430 other provincial troops from New England, and stays that garrison until springtime. Of the 430, 150 men are going to die of disease. And Whiting is then appointed as a lieutenant in the regular British Army that garrisons it for the next two years, along with Wooster. David Wooster is his longtime buddy, and that's Wooster's grave in Danbury, Connecticut. And he goes through with Pepperell and he may have been the one that gets Whitey to become a Mason. And they go on. And in 1750, the two of them go to Boston. And the two of them bring back the first charter to bring the first lodge of Masons to Connecticut. It's Hiram number one in New Haven, Connecticut. Still there today. And he is a colonel in the Connecticut regiments throughout the war, as is Whitey. So they're long-time buddies. Whitey well, becomes a merchant businessman. He joins a judge, becomes a judge later, and they get all these business schemes going on. They're going to have a rope walk. Um, Thomas Darling is a famous guy. Why am I doing it? Come on, stop. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, why is it listening to me now? Let's see if I can get this talk. I'm sorry about this. Ah, it's as grumpy as I am at my old age. What year was Wyden born? Seven, uh, 1724. 1724. Yeah. Again, he becomes a very successful businessman. Um, they, he goes to London and will... This thing I'm going to show you later. In the same folder, I found three letters he writes to his wife from London that I had never known he was in London. But they're they're trying to circumvent the middleman, and so they have an agent over there. They're buying stuff in London, shipping it directly to New Haven, Connecticut, to cut out the middleman who was taking his cut. These guys are pretty sharp. They try to uh, get involved in shipping. The uh, ship gets sunk. On the way, they lose a lot of money. He joins a whole group. They're going to build a wharf. They try to have a lottery. They'll raise money. It can't be passed by the legislature first. Then they finally get it. 
They don't raise enough money. They find, eventually they get gets involved with the Susquehanna Clump Company, which was a plan settle new uh, colonies out on the Susquehanna River, river out in western Pennsylvania, New York. Susquehanna Company. If you take a ruler and put it at the top of Connecticut and the bottom of Connecticut. By charter, Connecticut's land went all the way to the Pacific Ocean and wasn't settled until during the Revolutionary War. And then later in the year, they tried to buy land from the Iroquois out in western New York. So this is all the stuff that's going on for the upper class wealthy people. He goes disenchanted, and then he tries to become the um, collector of customs. That doesn't come through. Gets involved with Ben Franklin, who wanted to set up a printing office in New Haven for his nephew. That falls apart. He finally marries Mary, who he calls Molly, and he also calls his charming Delia. And they end up having um, nine children, and you can, you can almost follow. When he's home on leave between the campaigns of war, nine months later, she's got a child. But sadly, only four live past infancy. So three sons and a daughter. One son goes on to fight in the Revolutionary War um, for the Americans. She outlives Whiting, and her second husband, she also outlives him. But he had been Whiting's rival for her aunt when he was stuck up at Louisburg. In the letters, he goes back, oh, my dear Delia, please hang on. Don't marry that guy until I get back. I'm up here serving my country. Uh, I love you very much. And... She comes from a very influential thing. Now, he's a soldier for every campaign, which, blow, which got me interested in finding. 1755, I mentioned, he gets a, first he gets a commission in the regular British Army in the independent companies. Uh, he gets a lieutenancy. So he starts recruiting for that. Then all of a sudden, the Connecticut Assembly appoints him as a lieutenant colonel in command of a regiment, because the guy that's in command is old and doesn't go to the field that year. And... He's going to go to the campaign at the Battle of Lake George. He has his friend Isaac Stiles, who's a reverend in uh, New Haven, on the New Haven Green here, writes this sermon that they give a fire and brimstone speech to march off. He's an old light. At this time, the church is splitting in half, old lights and new lights. Connecticut's almost cut in half. From the middle of the state east are the old lights. They still have that Puritan vein to them. And to the west, they're the new lights. And boy, these, the churches, they're battling each other. You think we have religious issues today. <laughs> he goes to the Battle of Lake George and the Bloody Morning Scout on July 8th, or September 8th. He is in the back of the column back here and is um, out of the kill zone. So Massachusetts troops and the Indians get hammered real hard. Whiting is able to keep the retreat from going crazy, and it allows a two-hour retreat, which allows William Johnson to fortify Lake George Beachhead, and is one of the reasons why they're able to win the Battle of Lake George in 1755. Whiting commands at Fort, Number, uh, Fort Edward during that winter over seeing the construction of Fort Edward in New York. 1756, I tell you, it was a disaster. Nothing much happened. He's up at Fort Edward again, continuing the construction. 1757, we just went through. He's here, garrison commander. 1758, he's in the attack on Fort Ticonderoga, Fort Corral. 1759, he goes with Amherst up to complete the attack, and Fort Corleone, Crown Point, Fall. 1760, he goes with Amherst, and they go up the Mohawk River down the St. Lawrence, and Montreal capitulates on September 8th, and all the cannon falls. At the end of that capitulation, he's sent back, and he ends up in Rome, New York, at Fort Stanwix, continues the construction there. 1761-62, he marches up the Crown Point Road. Remember, at 59, uh, end of 59, he was over here uh, discharging troops. Well, he marches back up the Crown Point Road, and he is garrisoning Crown Point as they build that fortification. 
which was destroyed by Tom Hughes. <laughs> oh, sorry, Tom. I didn't know you were sure. Uh, well, this blow up the bridge. <laughs> uh, after that, he goes and joins the regular British Army as a captain in the Independent Company down in South Carolina until it's disbanded in 1764. This is a list of his campaigns and the, the months he's there. So the bottom line, at the end of his military career, he has served 11 campaigns, three winter garrisons, including here, for 120 months or 12 full years of his life. And if you take into consider what the rest of the colonies were doing, 541 officers served one time, only one time. Out of that, 277 only served once. A quarter, 131 served twice. And a quarter, 133 served three or more times. He's in pretty elite company for that. Plus, the Louisburg, South Carolina, Campaign. The only thing he missed was the Havana campaign in '62, which his buddy Wooster went to. He becomes uh, tries to become a customs collector. He does all these things. I'm going to fly through these. Basically, he becomes a political powerhouse in Connecticut. Civic duties. And in case you don't know what a freeman is, you have to be 21 in Connecticut. You have to be 21. Have to own land or have at least 40 pounds of. Um, uh, money, be of uh, honest conversation, acceptable to the majority of town voters, and only Freeman could vote and be approved uh, by the town selectmen and make sure that you were of good, peaceable behavior and civil conversations. A lot of us would be in trouble there. <laughs> He's appointed a uh, grand juryman, in case you don't know what that is. <laughs> they were watchdogs of moral behavior. I would have been in big trouble with those guys around. <laughs> he, again, with Wooster, brings the first Masonic Lodge to New Haven, Connecticut, Iron Lodge. That's in New Haven, that's what it looks like today. Back in those days, there was no lodge. Masons, I'm trying to talk my brother Masons into going back that way. They went to taverns all the time. Their meetings were at taverns. And instead of paying dues, when you got a notice, you didn't pay your dues, they got a notice. Uh, Dear Barry, you didn't pay your bill at the tavern last week, could you please pay? So that was more important. Uh, Wooster became the first master of the lodge, which is the leader of the lodge. At that time, uh, Whiting was the third man, and then in 1764, he be, uh, 65, he becomes uh, master of the lodge. And then he, be, again, he goes through all the <coughs> assembly points, go through these fast. These are all the committees and things he's on. He voted the selectmen, there's seven. Only 35 men filled this slot. He's chosen to represent as a deputy. Deputies are elected twice a year. 17, he's elected a justice of peace. He go, finally gets into the upper house the year he dies. Basically, once you get into this, it's like a, a senate. You're there until you die. <coughs> and then he dies in 1771. He was also involved in land speculation. I mentioned the Susquehanna. After the war, he tries to get land out in uh, western New York with his friend Sir William Johnson. Uh, then he tries to, he petitions and does get land in Vermont, in Whitingham, Vermont. He gets a, a 10,000 uh, acre land grant in the town of Whitingham, which is named after him. And he bought and sold land all over the place. He finally dies in April 19, 1771, and these are some of the comments. Basically, he was a well-maintained religious character, a gentleman, very graceful, etc. General, benevolent. 
newspaper wrote at the time, had he lived, he would have undoubtedly become the next governor of Connecticut. At the time of his death, he had an estate of uh, 11, uh, 1,320 pounds, which in today's money is $200,000. Not enormous, but that's pretty well off for that time frame. So he was a man of good means. He was first buried behind the church on the green, but then when that was rebuilt, they got moved about two blocks away to Grove Circle, which is a drug zone now. You want to go in there. I did this on a Sunday morning, figured they'd all be passed out, and there are bodies in there during the day. It's bad. Um, but that's the thing. His family and children's, Tombstones are broken off, they're stacked up against the back. In the Connecticut Historical Society, John Bush was a black hornsmith who uh, decorated powder horns, and famous for his artistic work. And Whiting's powder horn that Bush made for him is in the Connecticut Historical Society. What a good looking guy, huh? <laughs> and his sash. Uh, which is made of Moroccan red leather, is in the uh, Litchfield Historical Society, um, and <coughs> beautiful. Moroccan leather was, gentlemen would have that. And Mary Clapp, this was sold at auction a while ago, um, uh, her art, uh, her needlework, uh, the trouble is there's like seven Mary Clapps, we don't know which one it was. Could have been his mother, could have been his wife, mother-in-law, it could have been any one of them. Okay, now my 15 minutes at the archives. There was this Whiting Kilbourne finder's aid, and most of it was 1800s later, 1860s, 1880s, 1890s. I never paid attention. For 35 years, I never paid attention to the damn thing. Because it was his mother-in-law's family, and I'm thinking, I really care about those people. I want Whitey. So I get there and I open up the um, folder. I see a couple five letters from Whitey. Ah, oh, I'm ecstatic. But the Holy Grail is this. This is a plan for Colonel Whiting by his obliged humble servant, Joseph Blanchard. Joseph Blanchard is an officer in the New Hampshire Regiment. They do not know what this is. They did not know where it comes from. I have to go back and try to figure out what it is, where it came from. I am 95% sure it is a map that was drawn by Blanchard in 1757 for Whiting when he was in command right here. Remember Loudon told him he had to continue having scouts out towards St. Francis and out to Lake Champlain and Crown Point. Now, when you look at these old maps, you got to turn them. They're not on a north-south axis. So I'm going to show you that in a minute. So in other words, this is the Connecticut River. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the Connecticut River. This is Lake Champlain up here. you got to keep turning So... I'm 95% sure that this is what it is. Now, fort number four is right there. Again, you've got to keep turning the map because it's not laid out like a, a real map would be today. So this is the Connecticut River where we're at now. And this is Lake Champlain and Otter Creek. And again, you're turning, you've got to keep turning the map. Now, you guys got homework. This winter. Because if this is what I think it is, 1757, what I need to know is, A, what falls is this? Now, if you follow my little bluish green line, just to the inside of that is, I'm going to get my other pointer here, if you excuse me a second. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> So here's Crown Point, and notice they go southeast to a falls. I think that's probably Middlebury. Okay, so that's the first thing you guys might confirm, because they're going southeast a little bit. 
Now, that white, you can kind of see the white dotted line. It's real faint. And I'm going to have a professional photographer pho uh, photograph this, and we're going to get better. Then, at the falls, he's still staying on the western side. And then they cross a brook or a river. So that's my next question. What the heck brook or river was that? Because the important of my blue line is out of whacker. The white dotted line comes across Otter Creek and starts heading due east, just beyond that brook. So that my drawing is not good there. So it's up here more. So if we could figure out where that brook was, that would give us an indication where that trail was. Now remember, this is before the Crown Point Road. This is how they were going. I don't know. That's your homework for the winter. It's, it's, I expect an answer that will be a quiz. It's something that flows into the Otter Creek. Yeah. Yes, because it's it's connected. Here's the Otter Creek, so it's and it's flowing west. Mm -hmm. So, so thinking, if you guys can figure that out, the Newberry River, Yashemi River. Brandon. You know, Brandon. That's, that's your homework, big boy. It's four. <laughs> okay, so that's the western side. Now come over to our side of the river. We're down here, fort number four would be just off the map here. There's the Black River, right there. Mm -hmm. Here's the Little Sugar, which is just north of us. The Great Sugar, which is just on the other side of Claremont. This is what is today off Gachi, I mean the, I can't even say Yes, the Quichi. I knew that, I'm in the wrong part of the country. River there today, and that's what they called it in those days. And that's the falls, which today they call Summers Falls. White River, Wells River, and Amanusas runs off this way. Okay. Now, what blows my mind, and Sabrina, is this right there. Blockhouse. In 1760, you remember when I did my talk last year? In the journal, they talked about the New Hampshire guys coming and building the blockhouse over by the ferry landing on the western side. So if this is what I think it is, 1757, was there a blockhouse? It's on the map. That's your homework, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. You got homework. You got homework. You all got homework. <laughs> now, what's interesting about this, and I'll show you bring it up in the middle. The Wilder Dam, which is just up by White River Junction, if you follow the story of Northwest Passage, Robert Rogers raid, Northwest Passage with Spencer Tracy and Robert Young, Rogers' raft from here goes over that dam, which is a waterfall at the time, no dam, and crushes his raft. They rebuild the raft on their return from St. Francis, and the Sumner Fall is the second one. They ease the raft over, and they're desperate. They're starving. If they break up that second raft, they may never be able to get down here. Now, the other part of that same story is about four miles to the north of Fort Number 4, Rogers, on his little raft, runs into woodcutters from Fort Number 4. So that might have been either the Great Sugar River or the Little Sugar River, right there and there on the map. Okay, this is Robert Rogers' map that he drew after the French and Indian War of his raid. And again, this is where we are here. This is from Bob McGuire, friends of Crown Point Road. Everybody knew him, Bob passed away. Well, this, was Bob, this is Bob's map that's still owned by him, I assume. And it's been published in uh, John Ross's uh, War on the Run and my friend Tim Tadish's new book, Rogers Rangers. And it, so that's where you can see it if you have never seen this map before. And this was Bob's map. This is the one Robert Rogers drew after the war of his St. Francis raid. And again, boom, boom, boom. Why am I pointing that out? Pretty similar. Unbelievable. If what I think I found is real, for us down here, look at the matchups. This is uh, Rogers' 
map that McGuire has. Wow. Look at the date, which would make sense. Because Blanchard's New Hampshire guy, Roger's New Hampshire guy, Stark, John Stark's obviously, we know that he was telling Rogers about the St. Francis village. He was probably telling him how to get there. He's a New Hampshire guy. It would make sense. So when will you let us know about that map? As soon as I get my butt here. <laughs> COVID, COVID <laughs> threw everything into a tizzy. Uh, thank you. Anyway. <laughs> back up there. Um, again, I told you it's the 15 minute research rule. Yeah. You got 15 minutes to close. I went running around. The woman who's the main curator wasn't there that day. Her assistant had no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> they didn't even know what that folder existed. <laughs> and which is not unusual. Um, I go to, uh, you know, like the Clements Library at the University of Michigan and they had map um, documents for Connecticut provincials they weren't Connecticut provincials, they were Massachusetts guys. And I said a bad word when I realized what, what it was. But we fixed that because, uh, like they explained, the, the clerk who gets the item reads it and it may say Connecticut trips or something. And they don't know history like most of us, so they just label it that and they show it in the file unless some historian comes stumbling by. Yes, Dale? That document, the Holy Grail. Yeah. It was entitled or identified as a plan. To me, yeah. that makes it sound like that's going to become, not necessarily what it is. So that blockhouse could be shown as something that's going to be Well, built. see, I think what the plan is, he is told by Loudon that he has to have scouts going to um, Lake Champlain. That's the plan. So Whitey probably said, hey, Dale, i got to go from this place, and i got to send scouts over there. How do I do it? I think that's what he mean by the plan. You know, John, it's, it's, it's 3.15. I, I think, yeah, so I'm gonna, I, I, you'll be around for a few minutes. I'll close up. Any questions that I can do? It. Thank you for your thank attention. You. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Don't forget your homework. Yeah. <laughs>